Hello, everyone, and welcome to No Reserve. It's part of the Haggerty Podcast Network. We're here to help you make sense of the enthusiast car market, whether you're buying, selling, or just watching. Now, this week, we return to the Ferrari market and a really slick 1986 Testarossa. We talked Shelby with a Tiger, a GT350, and a Dodge Viper, and holy smokes, there's a six-figure Honda S2000. I'm Larry Webster, editor of Haggerty Media. And I'm Dave Kinney, publisher of the Haggerty Price Guide. Now, between the two of us, we've got decades of experience buying, selling, and driving the cars we love. Plus, we're backed by the data of Haggerty Valuation Tools. Okay, we're recording this on Thursday, October 6th. Um, there's just a lot of news out there about challenging economic times. And maybe we see that affecting the car market a little bit. Dave, what are you seeing this past week? You know, Larry, the best way to describe it is every time we've talked about this for the last uh, 15 years, when the uh, economy goes south, the car market seems to stay up or get better. I don't know if that's going to last forever. I obviously can't. Uh, but uh, yeah, there's a lot of headwinds, a lot of challenges in the uh, outside market. Everybody's talking about it. Um, you know, we thought that things would go really, really bad during the housing crisis. They didn't after a short period. We thought that things would go bad. You know, name your favorite crisis, uh, you know, name uh, whatever it is. Uh, people are, are have bought into the fact that uh, they like their cars. They're going to keep their cars if they can. So we'll see if that continues. Uh, we'll see if it, it affects the auctions. I'm not as optimistic as I was uh, six months, eight months ago. Uh, but it's not like I've turned into a pessimist. I still uh, I still uh, think we got some room left in a lot of these cars. Yeah, it's it's pretty interesting. Even on the ground, I, I listed a radical, an old radical race car, 2003. I priced it really, uh, I think, aggressively, meaning not high, low, because I was concerned about people spending, um, I don't know, maybe fun money. And I sold it in two yeah. days. It was it wasn't super expensive. It was twenty two grand, but I was still kind of like, oh wow! I thought a race car at the end of the season, I was going to have this thing for a while. But there seems to still be people willing to spend a fair amount of money on their hobbies. Yeah, and I think that's important that you know that we remember. And the, you know, for you know, obviously, race cars that can be an expensive hobby. Your race car wasn't uh, certainly on the uh, you know the expense, expensive end of it. But yeah, I mean, uh, I think people are, you know, they're still all in uh, and I think they'll stay that way for yeah, as long as they can. I mean, it's the uh, it's the same old story with uh, belt tightening everywhere. Uh, sometimes it means that they're not going to buy a lot of stuff for their race car or they're not going to go to as many events, uh, but they sure do like having it. So there you go. Yeah. So 08, 09, the big crash, the last one that we saw it. The market dipped, but it didn't last long. I think a lot of people, if memory serves, saw it as a buying opportunity. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, it can always serve as a, that sort of thing can always serve as a buying opportunity for somebody. If, uh, you know, there's a lot of cars that come out on the marketplace and you're the one who has the cash, you know, take care. Yeah, so we're certainly seeing that. I mean, the first car that I think we should talk about is one that we mentioned last week. It was, it's a Ferrari Testarossa that sold on uh, Bring a Trailer. In 1986, it sold for 150 grand, which seems right in the right up the middle, but right kind of what we expected for it to sell, which suggests that those things are still, you know, they're very stable cars. Yeah, you're uh, you, you didn't like the color. I love the color, uh, you know, because it's not red and tan. I guess that's why I love the color. It's a you know, it's a it's kind of a plum color uh, with a black interior. It's a great looking car to me. It is not a perfect brand new car. Uh, it's a, a family, one single family owned it for 33 years. 150 is what I'd call the sweet spot on that car. It is not a, uh, you know, not a, ch- a snake charmer, just absolutely beautiful, all jewelry, all that sort of stuff. It's the kind you want to buy to, to own and enjoy. And I like that. So, uh, you know, enough said about that. We, uh, we saw that on, on bring a trailer, uh, last week, but 150, um, the right money for that car. I mean, I'm going to give a uh, big applause to both the buyer and the seller on that one. Yeah. Yeah. Totally great. The one that really caught my eye was also on bringer trailer. It was a 1970, uh, Plymouth AAR Cuda. Um, the reason I like these cars or why they, this one especially caught my eye was that first the Gurney provenance, you know, uh, Dan Gurney raced, um, the Plymouth Cuda in the 1970 Trans Am season had the driver with him. One of the best names ever was a guy named Swede Savage. It didn't oh, yeah. do that well, but you know that was the time where they actually had to race what they sold, so they had to produce at least twenty five hundred of the modified race cars, and they made only twenty seven hundred of these cars. 
And um, this one did have an automatic, but it, it sold for what I thought pretty great price for something so interesting, 87,500. Is that, uh, I thought that was really well bought. What are your things? You know, I think it's, uh, okay, so if we have our number two at 100 grand and our number three at 71, we can call that straight in the middle. So uh, mm. we could call that car a two minus car. And I think that's probably, or a three plus, I think that's probably correct reviewing the pictures. Um, like so many things on Bring a Trailer right now, it didn't get all the love. I mean, it got some love, but there were, you know, there are people with, uh, you know, the keyboard warriors, you know, what can you say? Everybody behind a uh, keyboard is, you know, is, is a freaking expert on everything. Um, you know, without going into the, the details on it, I think it's sold for appropriate money. But when you think of it, Larry, uh, you know, 88 grand for that, 87 and a half, I think that's a really great car for the money. Lots of fun. It's got all the, you know, the 70s uh, Mopar colors. Uh, you know, it's got the uh, uh, fiberglass hood with the stripe on it. It's got the, uh, uh, let's see, that was the uh, side pipes. Uh, it's yeah, got the a really AAR, cool the, the whole manual. A, yeah. all American racing package. Uh, so, spoiler the fiberglass hood, the strobe stripes on the side. So, um, it's a lot of fun, although you're right, it's an automatic. But you know, we're seeing more and more people say, Yeah, I'm okay with an automatic. So, there we are. Yeah, especially in a car like this. I, I just thought that the Gurney Premium or the Gurney Provenance would add more to this car than it seems to because he's such a you know a huge figure in in u.s motorsports history but i guess um, yeah and a great and, and a great guy too i'm sure you've met yeah. him uh, yeah. uh he was just that you know he was like uh you know everybody's uncle he had the you know the the jokes he had the stories boy did he have the stories and a genuinely nice person uh you know the, the world's not a better place now that he's not here because it was a better place when he was and uh, you know you look at every gt40 that's got a little uh, modification on the uh, top of the door there the gurney bump and every time i think about that because he was tall um yeah. I, I smile every time i think about that he got to, he got a, a piece of a car named after him from that so i think that's yeah great too. well the, there's the gurney flap he's the only american yep. to build his own formula one car and win a formula one race at spa in 1967 after winning the 24 hours of lamar a week before with aj foyt i mean uh, that history just doesn't get any better what does kitchen yep. or what caught your eye this past week well, Sunbeam Tiger, I was at the Audrain uh, Museum, the Audrain Concord this weekend, and so I got to see a couple of cars. Uh, you know, you don't always get to see them when you're, uh, you know, when you're out on the road. I got to see this 66 Sunbeam Tiger. Uh, it sold for $84,000. Um, that is between our number one and our number two. Tiger prices are all over the place. Um, I will mm-hmm. say that for the longest time, I mean, you know, not everybody notices, but Sunbeam Tigers tracked Cobra prices. I think they still do. If you can't afford a Cobra at a million dollars, a Sunbeam Tiger is the principal substitution car that you want to go to next for a lot of people. Uh, it mm-hmm. does have all kinds of great heritage. It's a British car with a you know big American V8. In this case, uh, uh, you know a Ford V8. In this particular case, a 260. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, this is a Series One car. There are a number of different series. Uh, you can make an argument for why you like every series of Tigers. I kind of stick with the series one. I, I kind of like them best, but I can certainly see why, why? other people, I, you know, purity of design. Basically, it's got the 260 and not the 289, the early cars. Um, and I think that's a fun story. Uh, it's just, you know, another impossible car that didn't happen. This was Roots Group, R-O-O-T-E-S Group, that uh, became part of British Leyland later on. Basically, kind of a... Uh, uh, you know, you, you could say a, uh, you know, a, a British American hybrid of the, uh, of the nth degree, but like I said, they track Cobra prices. So, um, uh, there's a heck of a lot more tigers out there than Cobras, but when Cobras get more expensive, they tend to as well. Yeah. But it sounds like these have settled in like Cobras, right? They're sort of, uh, you know, the, 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 the prices are pretty stable. Your point is very well taken, sir. That is correct. But so have uh, Cobra prices. They've stabilized over the last uh, over the last couple of years. I mean, there's always going to be you know there's always going to be outliers on that, uh, obviously. But yeah, they've uh, they've done some uh, they've done some pretty cool uh, uh, things in the past. We everyone knows somebody. If you're in the old car world, everybody knows somebody who's owned a Tiger uh, at one time or another because they're kind of the gateway car to uh, a lot of other race cars for people as well. Have you noticed that, Larry? That, uh, yeah. Well, know, they're, they, they're, they... I mean, they're so fun to drive. 
right? It's a bit, yeah, it's a exactly. tiny little light British Roadster with a torquey American V8 with instant throttle response. So they sort of hit that. It's like a MG on steroids essentially is what it is. And they're really fun. And I mean, that's that car to me, to your point, it's like a lot of value for the car, even if you're closing in on six figures. I mean, you get all that history, you get something really fun to drive. And it sounds like a really good place to store some money too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Other thing I saw that I liked uh, that I wanted to talk about, we talked about it last week, the Maserati Mistral 4000. Uh, that's mm-hmm. the big engine, the four liter uh, uh, Maserati Mistral. And, and because it's Italian and because it was of that time, from what I understand, even though they weren't officially cataloged, you could get a three liter, you could get a 3.2 liter, a 3.7 liter. So, you know, it was Italy, it was the 60s, they would do what you want, I guess. So, uh, uh, this one has the four liter engine, which is the big dog. It obviously has the uh, manual transmission, although they did make some with automatics. Uh, kind of the last year of the car, 66, cause, so it's kind of the end of the uh, end of the series. However, when I saw this car in person, it has lots of needs. It's not a bad car. Uh, I didn't hate it. Um, it's got wavy chrome. It's got some paint issues. Uh, you know, you could it's base a, it's a driver. Some, Right yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. But uh, I I had hit this one for, you know, uh, being dyslexic. It makes it easy. I'd hit this for 140 and it sold for <laughs> one one fourteen. But I understand the reason why. And I do know that it's sold to a dealer. So he saw value in it as well. So you can expect to see this one cleaned up sometime later. Um, you're not, uh, you know, when we talked last week, you're not a huge Mistral fan. I get that. It's the car before uh, the Ghibli and the Ghibli was a V8, and this is again a six cylinder car playing in a 12 cylinder or at least an eight cylinder world. So, you know, that's got that kind of negative, but that beautiful Frua body, you can see it's very similar um, to the AC uh, car of its day. The not the not the Cobra, but the AC cars uh, made a, a number of cars with very, very similar body style. Um, yeah. And uh, you know, it's an acquired taste. I get it, but I, I tend to like those things a lot. And I no, think, I think 115, it, well, it's it's a great buy. So I think it was an interesting choice. And those straight six engines usually sound pretty terrific, and they're really smooth. So there's a lot going for it. I mean, let's talk about condition for a second. In the Haggerty Price Guide, like number one is the most perfect car in the world, or the most perfect handful of cars in the world. Number two is really really nice, just about new, and. This one, you said, you know, it's a driver quality car. Where would you put it on the one to five on the Haggerty Price Guide range? In condition? Well, interesting, interesting you should ask, uh, Mr. Webster, because uh, after looking at this car and seeing what it's sold for, our number four right now is 161. And this car was not a high number four. But I think that means we need to uh, take another look at our uh, our values here. I think that... Uh, I'm not uh, not predicting that it's going to happen, but I would not be surprised if the the prices don't go down in our next uh, next price guide. Um, mm-hmm. I'm in charge of I'm in charge of pricing these, so we'll we'll find other ones that sold. Uh, one car does not make a price guide, obviously, but if we see a couple more, and I did see a couple of uh, not not the uh, four liter cars, but I've seen a couple of them sell recently, and I think our number right now is a little bit high on the price guide, so. Um, oh. you know, there's, there's a, a preview for you on uh, January 1st. You might see these things coming down that, uh, so, you know, who, yeah, it's a well-bought yeah. car. Like, oh, I think it's so. a good car. Like, yeah. Yeah. Like I said, it was sold to a dealer and, you know, dealers are not in the business of buying cars that they can't make money on. Although it happens. Sure. Um, I would say that, uh, yeah, I, I think that there's, uh, you know, it, I would think the car would be instantly flippable for, you know, 125, 135, something like that. Uh, which gets a little bit closer by a number four price, but we're still not all the way there. So, um, like I said, one car doesn't make a uh, you know doesn't make a market. It's only uh, you know this could be a, an outlier, but uh, the condition I think really uh, uh, dragged this car down, and and probably the interest in this car as well. Okay, on the other side of the spectrum, for not a lot more money, uh, but totally different in terms of era, is. Uh, this car that's a 2008 Honda S2000 CR. The CR is important. It's sold on Bring a Trailer for $125,000. It only had 6,000 miles, and the CR stood for club racing, and they yep. were you know, similar to the AAR. These were some of the upgrades that Honda made to the car to make it um, a racier machine. So they, they did a differential. They did um, 
different suspension. They had some aero tweaks. I've raced both the CR and the non CR, and the difference was striking. The the base car loose, really hard to drive, shockingly, and then this car was fantastic on a racetrack. I think we we did twenty five hour Thunder Hills in it. I don't know if we won or not. It was a ways back, but just brilliant, brilliant cars to drive. And they didn't make a lot of them, only 700. But this really shows the strength of these late model JDM specials, doesn't it? Yeah. And this was, you know, I mean, the British call it a run out special. I love that term. Uh, that's when you've got a whole bunch of extra bodies and, you know, they're not selling real well. So you you go you go ahead and make them into a, uh, you know, in, in bunny ears, air quotes, uh, run out. Um, and so they made these club racers near the end of the run, uh, or at the end of the run. And believe it or yeah. not, Larry, they were tough to sell when new, you could buy one at a discount. I don't remember those days, uh, all that well, cause I wasn't in the market, but it was a $25,000 car. And what this thing sold for was exactly a hundred thousand dollars more than that. Uh, that's a pretty darn good investment to, uh, you know, have 6,000 miles worth of fun. I think that's what the miles were on this one. Yeah, 6,000 miles worth of fun and uh, get 25, I mean, get $100,000 back on your $25,000 investment. I'll do that all day long. Uh, you know, I don't have any problem with uh, waiting 14 years to make uh, make 100 grand off of uh, off of 25 grand while enjoying it. And another example of what you can do with cars if you pick the right one, a loser car to begin with, That's not. it's a little tough. A hard to sell car to begin with, uh, never a loser car, uh, but a hard to sell car to begin with. But uh, um, they're getting their revenge now, aren't they? What they made like seven hundred of them, something like 700. that. Seven hundred, yeah. I think it just speaks to uh, so many of these um, Asian specials or Japanese specials from the nineties and the early two thousands. You know, the uh, Supras, the three hundred ZXs, the RX sevens. I mean. Uh, you know, it's that generational shift we always talk about. The Gen X are just getting into the time when they've got their highest earning years. They're spending on the cars that they wanted but couldn't afford. And the best cars like this one is, I mean, it's probably a number two car, are, are really fetching high dollars. And I don't think this is a, uh, a bad investment or um, a silly purchase. I feel like these things are going to be strong for a long, long time because they're such wonderful things to drive. I mean, just that gearbox alone is almost worth the money. Just shifting it from second to third is it just feels so mechanical and direct. It's, uh, Oh, I got a lot of great memories in these. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the, the funny thing is that, uh, you know, once again, showing the love at, uh, uh, you know, in the comment section, there are a bunch of people who said there wasn't that much difference between the CR and the regular one. I think you yeah. disagree with that. I have a friend yeah. who has a CR and he would disagree with that as well. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, it's one of those things where sometimes, uh, you know, manufacturers make something as a special um, that kind of slips under the radar. And I think these things for the longest time have slipped under the radar. Apparently, one of the uh, the person who bought this, if I'm not mistaken, somebody said had bought this was the fourth one, the fourth yeah, uh, uh, S2000 that they bought on uh, Bring a Trailer. So in the business, we would say they're going long on uh s2000 so we'll see what happens they could be right there could be a lot of room left in this yeah they're starting to be recognized you know it's like the other one the integra type r um i can't remember the exact number but somebody who worked at honda told me that the the difference the number of parts that were different between a regular integra and the type r was some huge number like 80 percent different wow. fresh parts because it was a race car so i think these things are starting to be like they're almost like the modern shelby cobras in a way maybe that's not the perfect analogy, but these kind of racetrack specials. I know you said like this was a way to get rid of the bodies that they had left over at the end of the production run, but they're special and super cool. But sometimes, well, I, you know, I, oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, not so much for Honda because, uh, you know, they're a little bit better with their production numbers than, say, a, a Bentley or a Rolls Royce would uh, or an Aston Martin where they do the, uh, uh, you know, they're never officially called runoff specials. But I think that, uh, I think, you know, for Honda, I think there were a couple of people in engineering who were having fun, uh, you yeah. know, by, you know, saying, hey, you know, we're, we we want to produce another, you know, thousand, five thousand of these things. Let's do this. Let's do that. And let's do this and make them into specials. It, it didn't work for them when brand new. But boy, does it work for them right now? Yeah. One car that surprised me that didn't uh, it wasn't sold because it didn't meet reserve. Uh, it was also on Bring a Trail. It was a 1999 BMW 540i Sportwagon. 
This thing was modified with a S62 V8, had a six speed manual, looks fantastic. It was bid to 45,000 or, or just under that, which um, I was shocked at this car. I thought that audience and you know the, 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 the fervor for wagons, V8, stick shift, especially BMW, this thing would have gone off the charts, but it did not. So we're seeing a, a, a change to these kind of resto Monte cars, aren't we? Yeah, I think this sold once before for right around the same money uh, and you know, on Bring a Trailer, so it was really easy to track. Uh, I don't know what's been done since uh, I think it was 2020, the last time that was out, uh, what other mods have been made, if any. Um, uh, you know, I didn't track that car all the way through. Uh, you know, but it's a smaller market when you got a modified car because, it, you know, it's a it's kind of a hands on car for a lot of people. I think it would be fine for you. It wouldn't be fine for me. I'd rather have a uh, bone stock, to be real honest with you. But then again, I understand the uh, attraction of the, uh, you know, of the uh, the uh, uh, the modified car. It's it's kind of the BMW they never built for a lot of people. And I think that's cool for a whole bunch of folks. Yeah. Yeah, cars like this are right in my wheelhouse. I love tributes, modified, fakes. I feel like I get all the experience for a fraction of the dollars of the real thing and just something I can enjoy. I know it's not real. It's probably not an investment, but it's then I can enjoy it and not worry about it. But so, you know, maybe that thing will come pop back up and somebody will get it. But um, let's move on to our kicking tire segment. I want to talk about a car that's up for sale on the Broad Arrow auctions. It's the Jim Taylor collection. That's October fourteenth, fifteenth. You have a lot of experience with something like this. This is a sixty-five Shelby GT three fifty, right? This is the first uh, modified Mustang that Shelby made. I just love these cars. Um, yeah, yeah the story them? of this. Uh, I owned a sixty-six, a Hertz car, but I never owned a sixty-five. They were always special cars, uh, and there's a huge difference between sixty-five and sixty-six. And this, of course, is uh, basically a. Uh, a full-on race car, and this is one of the few that had striped elites, so that's why you don't see the uh, blue and white stripes, even though uh, everywhere or down the center, uh, like you do on so many of the uh, Shelbys. I think this is a, a car that uh, uh, Jim Taylor bought. I, the story was that it was coming into an event somewhere. It was on the back of a trailer, and by the time it was off the trailer, Jim owned it. Uh, you know, because he's a you know a passionate car guy. Uh, he's a friend, so I know him, so I can say that he uh, he buys what he likes and he enjoys it. Uh, you know, I, I, a Jim Taylor telling stories out of school story. I love this. Uh, he bought a super America Ferrari, super America. And when he sold it, I think it had 75,000 miles on it. He is the guy who buys a Ferrari and drives it. I could be wrong about the miles, but I mean, he's the one man test bed, uh, for Ferrari. You know, everybody takes their Ferrari and they go, Ooh, I can't drive it. You know, whatever. Well, they come for like a seven year warranty, uh, you know, Jim used the whole thing. I mean, you know, uh, so, yeah. I mean, he's a car guy's car guy when it comes right down to it. Um, these okay. cars we we have in the price guide at the top at 600000 all the way down to 305000 Uh This is a pretty special car. I'm not going to take a wild stab at predicting it, but I think that, uh, uh, you know, this car is going to do towards the upper end for sure. Uh, I don't think this car is going to strike loose at anywhere near the lower end. Uh, but that's what we do. We watch them and we wait and see, don't we? Well, it's interesting. You mentioned the two things that I think are important. And, and one is you're often buying the owner. And yep. so what you're suggesting is this guy, uh, Mr. Taylor, has a, a great reputation in the community. So the thinking is this car is well sorted. It's a good car if he bought it and he's owned it for a while. The thing I, I love about it is it's not perfect. It's It's got so much patina on it that you could really use it. And there's a lot of like Shelby only events that this car is now eligible for us. So you get all the experience, none of the guilt of using and enjoying it. I wish I had the dough. I would bid on it in a second. I love these things, especially with the steel wheels, the stripe delete. I mean, it just, it's, uh, this, this, this pegs all the boxes for me. Yeah. It's a, it's a time machine car. It's what you would have bought if you could go back and, uh, you know, and do all that stuff because, uh, uh, you know, I, I think I like the stripes a lot, but I think for the purpose of this car, I would have uh, done the same thing. I would have striped delete. And, and you're right. Those steelies look great on the car. Nothing flashy, all business. And that's what this car is. Totally cool. What are you looking forward to? Oh, I've got a uh, another bring a trailer car. We're heavy on bring a trailer this week. Uh, uh, 58 Porsche 356A convertible D. Now the convertible D, the D stands for Drouse, the uh, uh, coach builder. 
This is basically a speedster with roll-up windows. I mean, I know that there's a whole bunch of people who will get mad with me saying that, but it's a 59. uh, Well, because, uh, um, you know, the Porsche people, you know, they're they're going to tell me about all the differences other than just the the roll-up windows. To me, that's your basic fact. It's a low windshield car. Um, which is important because it's got the great look. This is a one-year-only car as well. It's listed as a 58. We have them in the book as 59. We all know how that happens. It's not a big deal. There's no, oh my gosh, about it. But anyhow, uh, it's wait, already... Wait, I don't know how that happens. How does this happen? What do you mean? What is, what's the discrepancy between 50 and 59? Okay, so sometimes cars get sold in 1958, even though they're, they were known as a 1959 model. So if this car was sold, let's say it was shipped to the United States and came here early, uh, they'd just put a 58 year on the title, uh, even oh. though most of them are, are you know, the, the production was slated for 1959. That doesn't mean that they couldn't build them in 58. So I and I don't know in this particular case, but that's how that happens in other cars. We have these cars uh, starting at a uh, at a number four for one fifty two, all the way up to three twenty eight. Uh, so our mid price, actually, our number three is one seventy. Coincidentally, that's where the car is right now. This is not a fresh restoration. Um, it is a uh, uh, an older restoration, but it seems to be from the photos. And of course, you know, it's it's uh, bring a trailer, so there's. You know, 1,150, exaggerating again, photos. Um, And uh, it looks pretty darn good to me. Uh, They made 1,331 examples of this. Uh, Single year production, you know, all that sort of stuff. So it's kind of cool. I like the fact it's, uh, you know, to me, and I know it's different to other people, it's kind of like owning a Speedster only with roll-up windows, which I kind of think is an advantage. For sure, you can use it more. So you're suggesting this auction doesn't end for eight days. So this car could perhaps reset the market for the D upwards. Yeah, it's possible. I mean, it's, you know, after what, two days out, it's already 170. Uh, so, yeah, or if one day out, I guess it's already all, already at 170. Uh, it, you know, it looks to be uh, it looks to be an honest car. It is not, like I said, fresh and brand new. It, uh, you know, you will not smell the paint drying on this when you get it home. Uh, the, uh, you know, the. Undercarriage shots look like a car that's been used. It doesn't look like a uh, show car. The engine shots, same sort of thing. Um, mm. But the paperwork on the car is exceptional. There's, a, you know, I bet you there's two pounds of paperwork that comes with this car. So I think that's cool as well. So yeah, it's all good. I'm with you. I'd, I'd love to have one of those. The other one I'm watching is is going to be sold by Meekum. It's a uh, it's a Dodge Viper. It's a second gen one. It's a 2005. This is the Copperhead edition. This one only has 4,000 miles on it and um, you know, we're seeing the Vipers, I think, rise and be quite strong. We had a GTS Coupe on the bull market list a few years ago because we think um, there's they were great value cars. You know, big V10, Lamar history. The second gen, I spent a lot of time in these. They were, they were much nicer cars than the yeah. first gen in terms of like you could drive them around. But to me, they lost some of that Shelby Cobra-ness that made the first gen so unique. But you can obviously use these things. I mean... You know, cool car, a lot of performance for the dough. They uh, they lost a little bit of the Shelbyness, but they picked up air conditioning. Huh? Is that uh, is that what you're saying? <laughs> uh-huh. So uh, they still you know, um, it. yeah, right, exactly. Um, this car's got a really nice history. Looking at it, uh, you know, from what I can see, uh, Meekum did a nice job, uh, or is doing a nice job presenting it. Four thousand seventy nine miles, number two hundred and twelve of three hundred of the Copperhead edition here in uh, the two thousand five, and. Uh, it's got the contrast stitching, the uh, you know the uh, body colored stitching, all that sort of stuff. Uh, looks like it's definitely along the uh, adult owned line, not the uh, boy racer owned, which is a you know a very very nice thing to have. Obviously, it's a six speed. Uh, that's the eight point three liter, five hundred horsepower uh, engine on this car. Um, oh I think there's a lot going on for these. We have them in the price guide, and I'm going to give you an approximate number because I had to add the eight percent we add for the Copperhead. Um, so we're talking uh, number four at 34 and a half. I mean, that's just a steal. That's a gift. A number three at 44, a number two at 60 and, or 66, it looks like. And then our number one is 83. I don't see how you could go wrong buying this car for our number one value. Uh, Um, I don't know if it'll, it'll go for that, but I mean, this is just the type of car you want to have in, uh, uh, in your stable of, uh, of fun cars to own. 
Uh, yeah, you're right. It took the rawness out of the uh, of the series one, uh, but there's a lot to be said for every series of the uh, of the uh, Viper. They they did get more luxurious, uh, you know, during the production run and all that. Uh, but again, uh, it's it's got a lot going for it. I I I would definitely own this one. Well, the thing that strikes me, we often talk about substitution, and as a lot of the prices for some of these cars go up, all suddenly, you know, if a Supra is worth one hundred and fifty thousand you know one of the best supras you know i always talk about like wow you can get a gallardo for that kind of money i mean you can get some really mm-hmm. special cars this car at that price um there's nothing like it uh the experience of driving these things is unlike anything else that v10 is really an on-off switch of power you can spin the rear tires at will you sit on the rear axle with this huge long motor and hood in front of you and they're just uh Super special in that regard and kind of raw. And when we always talk about these analog cars, something that uh, the driver is supremely important, there are few better than a Viper. So it'll be interesting to see. This is going to be uh, auctioned off at the Chattanooga uh, auction, Mecham auction, October 14th, 15th. So kind of a busy weekend coming up in terms of the Jim Taylor auction and also this Mecham stuff. But um, what a great car. Well, let's move on. We got some great questions. Dave, I'm going to. Pitch the first one to you. This is Aaron from Boulder. This is something we, we just touched on earlier. And his question is, how long do you think the manual premium will survive? And his point is, at some point, there won't be that many people who will really know how to operate a manual transmission or want to, you know, because right now we think it's about 10 to 20 percent, depending on the car, if it's got a manual. Do you see that staying? Do you think that premium is always going to be there? Or do you think at some point it just goes away? I think for different cars, the answer is different. Uh, you know, mm. I could see, I could see where, you know, in the Porsche world, I would definitely uh, say that that premium is going to last a very, very long time, if not forever. Mm. Um, you know, uh, you know, the, the the question becomes something along the lines of, you know, why are old race cars worth money? Uh, you know, it's because of the fun factor. It's because of the uh, event factor for the race cars. But uh, you know, driving a manual transmission, look, it's just more fun. It also uh, keep your kid from getting in an accident when they're texting because you can't text and drive a manual transmission car in city traffic. It is just absolutely impossible. You can either uh, stop the car and get out or stop the car and go in a parking lot uh, and text or not text at all. Um, and of course, you know, we all know the joke that it's a gener- generation X, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 safety device so that, uh, you know, you can't, your car can't get stolen. It's a security thing to have a manual transmission uh, gen y yeah gen y yeah you're right you're right so uh, any any generation lower than where you are uh but right. uh, the yeah the long story short is i think the manual premium is going to survive for a lot of cars but i don't see it surviving for every car uh in ferrari for example so they made so few of the manuals in a lot of these 2000 you know 2006 2010 era cars that uh you know just the rareness of them alone will make a difference um, I think know, anything so it, built before 2010, uh, the manual is going to always command a premium because they're not building anymore. And yeah, so that yeah. supply is fixed. Um, and if you want, you know, what do you like in these cars? The experience, the analog part. I think that's always going to drive enthusiasts. You, you cannot buy a new Ferrari with a stick shift and um, fewer and fewer cars are being made. The Corvette you can no longer get with a stick shift. So. I think it's only going to, I mean, some of the things I've heard though, Dave, there was a dealer that uh, told me once, he's like, look, if I had 356s, uh, Porsche 356s with an automatic, he's like, I would be unable to keep them in the showroom because so many of the next generation would show up. They love the style. They love the story. They didn't want the manual, which floored me. So to your point about the model to model difference, I think is really well taken. I don't know, have you ever heard stuff like that about you know, oh yeah, automatic cars. Really? Mm. Yeah, yeah, I have. Um, you know, it's interesting because <clears throat> the era of people who learned to drive a manual, like driving to school, is pretty well gone. Those are all people whose parents had a Honda, uh, you know, or a Toyota, or a, you know, something along those lines. And yeah. you know, those those guys, those gals are now you know in their forties. Um, you know, when mom and dad had one, or better, or fifties, or even sixties. Because uh, the manual transmission as an everyday car has pretty well just hit the skids, uh, so it's a it's a performance thing. It's a uh, you know a car person thing uh, more than it used to be, and I think that'll that'll stay that way. So yeah, so Aaron, manuals are still gonna 
mostly, with some some exceptions, mostly command a premium. Okay, Mark from Oklahoma. This is a great car he's asking about, a 2009 Pontiac G8 GXP sedan. It's a four-door sedan with a V8. Um, the Haggerty Price Guide, he says, it's worth 34000 ish in really good condition. That's a number two condition. Question is, should I keep or sell it? Is it going to be collectible? I'm going to say keep it all day long. Dave, what do you, what's your take? Yeah, I think uh, it's absolutely the answer is keep it. I mean, they made some, uh, you know, some even more special uh, uh, G8s uh, than, than this one. But, you know, it gets really funny because, you know, the old joke about General Motors is once they get it right, they kill it. Uh, unfortunately, yeah. they killed the, they killed the entire brand. Um, uh, that's a, another story for another day. But uh, in the meantime, um, you know, the enthusiast knew this car, even though it wasn't necessarily a you know a straight G8 GXP. wasn't named for uh, wasn't made for the you know the top tier enthusiast community. A lot of people would go down to the uh, dealership and say, "Yeah, I like that car. It's got a real sporty nature to it." Yeah, I think these cars have a lot of long legs left in them. Unfortunately, some of them are being used as daily, so they get worn out. You know, if uh, if they're in uh, your neck of the wood, you can't use these things as dailies over the winter because they will get the uh, the tin worm, the rust monster in them. Um, but uh, yeah, I think good ones of these. Uh, you know, he says his is in number two condition. I would definitely keep it. Uh, it's a good. Uh, you know, maybe not going to make a lot of money in the next five or ten years, but you know, there's a whole heck of a lot of cars that you could buy. You could lose a lot more money, and it could very well be that 10 years from now this thing is still worth in the 30s or maybe even more well we had a g8 in the bull market list the, the haggerty bull market list is we do this every year and, and funny enough i am in california today we're filming uh the two, 2023 edition that'll be out in december the idea being these are cars you can buy you can enjoy for a few years and sell which it's not really we're not saying you're going to make money and it's investment but you're you're probably not going to get killed and so the idea being you can really enjoy these cars and have a lot of fun for not a lot of money. And these G8s I love because this was the Bob Lutz special. Bob Lutz was a uh, automotive exec. He's still alive. He lives near us in Ann Arbor. And he joined GM in the early 2000s. And he looked at uh, General Motors Australia division, which was called Holden. And over there, they had these uh, kind of V8 powered sedans they liked. And he said, why wouldn't we bring those cars to the US, which is what he did first as a GTO and then as the Ford or GXP. And I think these are real sleeper cars. They big raucous V8 in the in the nose, stick shift, tons and tons of character. Later on, Chevy continued it with the SS, same thing, just fantastic cars. I wish yeah. I bought yeah. one during the time. So will these going to be like sedans? I think Dave is, is Four-door sedans generally don't do as well as like sporty performance models, but I think there's always going to be a special place for a car like this, especially in really good condition without 120,000 miles, like you said. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And, uh, you know, almost anything with the Maxima Bob, uh, the Maxima oh. Bob Lutz, uh, you know, moniker to it, uh, a car guy's car guy. So, uh, and, and somebody who, shall we just say, didn't always uh, tow the company line at GM. Uh, so, uh, you know, he's a, he's a, a hero to a lot of us, uh, in and of himself. Well, so uh, we wouldn't have the Viper, we wouldn't have the Viper yeah. without Bob Lutz. I mean, absolutely. There's a long yeah. list of cars we wouldn't have without Bob Lutz. So uh, he it's a is, good thing. I, he's one of the most fascinating automotive characters I've ever met, but, uh, okay. That's it for today. It's been, um, lots of action. Dave, any final comments? Well, I, I, you know, we we're talking, we opened the show talking about the economy. Uh, number one, don't ever buy a car because you think you're going to make money on it. Yeah, buy it because you love it. Buy it because you want to have fun with it. And the money is, uh, you know, it's the icing on the cake. Um, there are smart ways to buy cars that you can say, I don't think this car is going to appreciate like other cars. And that's, you know, that's, that's great. And every once in a while you get surprised like that, uh, Honda that we were talking about, that was, uh, you know, nothing but a surprise for, uh, you know, for a lot of people, the club racer. Um, so uh, what I would say is don't be scared by the economy. Uh, just keep your personal economy in mind and, you know, get out and enjoy your cars and buy something fun. Yeah, that's one thing that does bug me about the car circles a little bit. It, it, we do track the values because it really helps us be smart with our money. But there seems to be a, a, not many people are willing to say, I lost money on a car I owned. And I always joke, like I, I buy high and I sell low. 
Like it's, sure. it's a hobby like golf. I love it. Yep. Am I going to spend a little money on it? Sure. Did I get a lot of joy out of it? Absolutely. So, you know, we're here to really help you make smart decisions because a lot of times it is a big chunk of change, but gosh, make sure you're having fun because that's the whole point. Well, anyway, exactly. Dave, thank you so much for being here. We will thank you everybody for listening. We will catch you next week on No Reserve. Bye-bye.